Hey, thanks everybody for joining tonight. Uh, going to talk about yellow sparks, the sparks coming off the wire, this of uh, the trolley wire overhead over the bluegrass, Kentucky. Uh, horse cars and streetcar lines in Kentucky, 1864. First one's down in uh, Louisville, 1951. The last one is the Fort Mitchell line in Kentucky. So that's the history we're going to be covering tonight. We're going to be talking about trolleys and streetcars. People use these terms interchangeably. Trolleys normally mean it's got one truck underneath it, a center truck with two wheels. Streetcar normally means it's got a, a truck at either end, two wheels at the front and two wheels, two axles, I should say, four wheels uh, on the uh, car. So I say trolleys and streetcars, we're meaning the same thing, but if we really say trolleys, we're meaning a car with one truck underneath it, the early ones. These were the cities in Kentucky that had streetcar, trolley car, horse car service. Uh, Paducah in far western Kentucky, down here. Henderson, Owensboro, Bowling Green, Louisville, Covington, Ludlow, Fort Mitchell, Fort Wright, Newport, Bellevue, Dayton, Southgate, Fort Thomas. Ashland, May Maysville, Frankfurt, Paris, uh, sorry, Georgetown, Paris, Lexington, Winchester, Richmond, Somerset, I don't know if I said Bowling Green over here, and Barberville and uh, Middlesbrough. These were the wannabes. All these cities had a charter from state government to put a streetcar system in but they never really got off the ground. Fort Jefferson, uh, Princeton, Hopkinsville, going all across the state. All of these were developed to bring the streetcar from the, the train station to downtown, to the courthouse. And that's basically what the other ones were built for too. Travel in those days, if you're going anywhere, you go by train. If you go by train, most train stations are sort of located on the outskirts of downtown because the coming to downtown was a little expensive, except in a few cases where it worked. So we're going to talk about start off with separate but equal accommodations. I thought I ought to talk about Jim Crow laws in Kentucky before we get going in the rest of it. Uh, Jim Crow was not that, well, it was in Northern Kentucky. Just don't lie about that. But other parts of the state, I mean, it was really, really strong and affected within transportation. Quick little side story. I was hired by the Commonwealth of Kentucky in 65. 1966, they sent me down to Hickman, Fulton, Kentucky, on the Mississippi River. It was before the Western Kentucky Parkway was in. I mean, I had to drive the old road getting down there. It was an all-day drive. It was hot. I walked in the courthouse, saw a drinking fountain, and took a drink of water. And I had all kind of people screaming at me to get away from that, that, that thing. They were going to arrest me, and I'm going, what's on? Well, I drank water out of the colored water fountain. Uh, the county judge called all the way back to Frankfurt, repeating what I had done. So Jim Crow is a real thing. So in 1871, the streetcars, the horse cars, I should say, in Louisville are segregated. And a U.S. senator, a coward senator from Mississippi, I believe it is, is thrown off the streetcar and he's horse car. He sues and the federal court says, uh-uh, you can't have segregation on the horse cars in Louisville. So this stays true in Louisville throughout his whole life. Uh, do this federal court case in 1871. Now, in 1890, the Commonwealth passed a Jim Crow law for the railroads that said there had to be separate accommodations for white and colored pass passengers. Penalty is notice for the conductor or the passenger. They're getting right down to, to the individuals. $25 fine or imprisonment of 20 days in jail and also the officer and directors. But this is directed at the railroads, not to the streetcar companies. 
Then in 1892, they come out with an even stronger uh, separate. And now it's separate coaches on the train. Previously, you just segregated them on the coach. Now you got to run a separate car for the coward and separate cars for the white. By the way, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway will take this all the Supreme Court and lose. Uh, the railroads didn't like to do this because it's extra costs. Then in 1902, you got to have separate accommodations within the depots. And this is a real thing in Covington and some of the other depots. Because what the depots had in those days was a separate general wedding room and a separate ladies room. And what you find out is the railroads turn the ladies rooms into the colored wedding room, which doesn't go over well with you ladies. And then 1950, they, the new court rule comes out that says, oh, well, hey, streetcars, if they go more than 19 miles, they don't have to be segregated. But with all court rules, it sort of gets changed. In 1920, there's a change in the law. And the green line is fired by the Commonwealth of Kentucky for not having separate, separate streetcars for white and colored. And this is in the South Covington Street Railway versus the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And they were allowing colored people to ride on the streetcars with white people coming from Covington through Parksville to Fort Wright, South Fort Mitchell, and Fort Mitchell. Uh, of course, the colored people doing this are the maids and the servants and the, the, the uh, colored people working in the restaurants and that. Anyway. The streetcar company goes, we got to provide separate cars. We can't afford that. And basically, this gets ignored across Kentucky. And the colored people ride in the back of the streetcars. OK. Now, let's talk about some of the other things that the streetcar companies had to do with their charter. They had to pave the street that the rails were in. They had to clean the streets. They had to plow the streets when it snowed. By cleaning the streets, I mean, they had to wash them down and street clean it. And they had to maintain the street so that it was passable. And this really meant in wintertime when they plowed the, the railroad, the streetcar tracks, that all you guys with your horse and wagons got it where they plowed the street and wouldn't get out of the way of the streetcar. And the paved street is a very interesting thing, is these generally wound up being the first paved streets in your community. And the city of Shelbyville fought this for a number of years because the city council said, if they pave Main Street and run streetcars down here, everybody else in town is going to want a paved street, and we can't afford that. Well, the last time I was in Shelbyville, they must have been able to afford it because all the streets are now paved. But anyway. These are things that are going on within the, the streetcar era. It's many things are impacting. Now, this is important. The street rail and the overhead wire had to be replaced roughly every 30 years. It would simply wear out and you had to replace it. Now, of course, this was done at the cost of the streetcar company. The streetcar company also paid taxes on rail overhead wire, the equipment, and the power plant. Ooh, I should say mention here. The streetcar companies quickly learned that the money was not being made to move people by streetcars, but to sell electricity to the commercial establishments in town. And along the way, you get the power plants getting bigger and bigger to provide the power to the uh, commercial and residential homes. Interestingly, a side story, uh, down in Owensboro, Kentucky, which still owns their power plant, in 1920, a salesman came in town to sell you women electric stoves. And they ran him out of town because we couldn't afford electric stoves. Because that meant you women would be using them two times a day and demanding extra power. And we'd have to build this power plant with the sector capacity that only be used for an hour in the morning and the hour in the evening when you were cooking. Little did they know what was going to happen. Okay. The other thing to remember is money was not allowed to be escrowed. 
You could not set money aside to buy new equipment, to buy new rail, to repair the streets and all that. You had to issue a bond. Now you issue a bond for a million dollars. And it's most probably going to cost you between 1.1 million and 1.5 million to get your million dollars because the bank's going to charge you money for issuing the bond. And a lot of people may say, I'm not going to pay you $100 for that bond. I'm only going to pay you $90 because I want a better return. So this really drove a spike into these streetcar companies trying to finance the bonds along the way. The other problem was there was no standard streetcar gauge. Most charters did not allow streetcars to run on four feet, 8.5 inch gauge. That is standard gauge for the railroads in the United States. And the city of Covington or the city of Newport or whatever city you want that had, did not want the, rail, the street railways to pull railroad freight cars down their tracks through the heart of the city. So that meant they would not allow them to lay gauge four feet, 8.5. So you find the street railways five foot, five two, five four inches or narrower than that down to meter gauge or a little bit bigger. Those of you might be familiar with San Francisco, you knew San Francisco has a heritage streetcar line out there, the F line. They're always looking for cars to rehab and run on the F line. They recently found, recently being about six years ago, a bunch of Los Angeles PCC cars, which they were gonna buy. And they bought one, but they found out it was narrow gauge. And when they put their wide gauge trucks underneath it, they'll get, the trucks could not swing because the body was too small. Okay. So there were problems like that. Nickel fare. Everybody knows that there was a, Streetcar fare was to be a nickel. And if you read the book of Genesis, the Code of Hammurabi, the Rosetta Stone, the Sermon on the Mound, the Magna Charter, the Mayfair Compact, within the Declaration of Independence, and within the Bill of Rights, and President Wilson's 14 points, they all said streetcar fare was a nickel and it could be more than a nickel. Well, what happens is the early life, that's okay. You got steak nation and economy from the first time up through 1914. 1914, World War I breaks out and inflation sets out, which is due. It gets up to 10% or more per year. The streetcar companies are only allowed to charge a nickel. They can't meet their costs. During the 1920s and 29s, inflation drops. They're constantly fighting with the cities to get their uh, fair raised, and they'll maybe, oh, okay, we'll let you go to seven cents or things like that, or, you know, uh, okay, we'll let you sell uh, three fares for 12 cents, big deal. Uh, then in 1930, 29, 39, there's no money due to the depression. 40 to 45, they're making money, but you can't purchase anything. So in 46, you go to buses. And the reason why is, despite all you heard was, remember I said every 30 years you had to replace the rail, it meant you had to tear up the street, you had to replace the wire. Hey, that's all coming due in the late 40s. And by golly, if we go to buses, we don't have to maintain the streets. We don't have to clean the street. The city does. That's why we wound up with buses. Okay, the bus operator does not have to pay tax on rail. He doesn't have to take care of the overhead wires. He's not no power plant to worry about. The city maintains the street. The city plows the street. The city cleans the street. The city does all that. The buses don't have to do that. The other thing with the buses was General Motors, who in most stories are painted as the bad guys, I got rid of the streetcars, would often sell the buses to the city on a time. In other words, you made a down payment and you had four years to pay the buses off. You didn't have to do a bond issue. That wasn't always true, but they were willing to work with it, the companies. 
The other thing that happened was in 1933, Congress, against the pleading of the utility companies, ha, 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 said that utility companies could no longer own streetcar companies. This was a joy of the utility companies because most utility companies who owned streetcar companies were subsidizing the streetcar companies by taking the money that they were collecting for selling electricity to businesses and, and industry and homeowners and bringing it back to cover their losses on the streetcar company. Uh, I know the, the, the streetcar companies cried in public and in their, in their meeting rooms, they slapped hands and shouted hallelujah, uh, we're out from underneath the uh, streetcars. And this is another reason why the streetcar company start folding is because the, the electric company has been subsidizing them. The cities refuse to subsidize them until the 1970s or 80s when they're all gone. And then the bus companies are even folding because they can't cover their costs. Tank comes along. Okay, we're going to take a walk through some of the uh, streetcar companies in Kentucky. Take a look at them and just look at them. Ashland, Kentucky, for those who are don't quite know the Commonwealth of Kentucky is located up here. This is their layout of their line. They were actually connected to Huntington uh, by the uh, an interurban company. And if you cross the Ohio River on the ferry boat, there was an interurban company that took you from Ironton down to Portsmouth. But this was the streetcar company within uh, Ashland. There is a view of Ashland. The streetcar company is running like this and like this. The, at that time, the uh, train station was down here. Public landing was down here. That's another thing I should mention. Many of the streetcar companies on the river cities connected the public landing into town also, along with the, uh, the uh, depot. Here's one of the streetcars in uh, Ashland. The automobile's starting to come along. You notice the street is paved. The rails are sunk down the ground. These rails did provide through problems in that the uh, wagons, when the guy would horse and wagon in town, he'd get his wagon wheels dropped down into the uh, the rail. Uh, there's a groove between the, the, the inside of the rail in which the flange of the of the uh, streetcar wheel dropped down into to hold the streetcar on the rail. Another view of one of the streetcars in Ashland. Downtown Ashland with the streetcar running through. Downtown Ashland looks much like this. Cars are still there, but the streetcars are gone. They do have a bus service. Now down to Barberville. Barberville's down here, the home of Union College. This is the layout. And let me go back. Uh, whoops, we'll catch the next one. So the Louisville Nashville Railroad ran out here. This came down into town. The Cumberland River's down here. This whole area floods almost every year. The railroad built the, its line out of the floodplain. So less, it was a mile from the depot downtown. So here's the railroad line out here, Louisville, Nashville, the depot right down here. You went down this street and cut across and everything down here would flood every year. Here it is. Car number 288 was their only car. They bought it from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, the line was owned by a gentleman who leased it out to every year to somebody to operate. Another view up. So I said this lasted till 1919. There is debate whether it was the last horse-drawn streetcar line in the United States or not. There is constant debate about whether it's the last one or not. And you can see he has his hand on the brake. And he's got his hands on the rein. 
So you stop the horse, but the car keeps rolling. So it's got to tighten the brake on the wheels to stop it. The local museum down there does have this wheel in their uh, museum and a picture of the horse car. Bowling Green, Kentucky, way down here in Warren County. That's where the Corvette Museum dropped down in the sinkhole. That's where all Corvettes are built. Third largest city in Kentucky, believe it or not. I don't know what happened to Covington. It dropped uh, Louisville, Lexington, and then Bowling Green are your major cities in Kentucky. I think Covington's like six. Sorry about that. Here's the streetcar route. It ran from the public landing up to the depot, went out here, split. The one went out to the uh, fairgrounds, and the other one line goes out to the cemetery. Hey, what better could you ask for? Public landing, depot, uh, cemetery, and fairgrounds. Destination at either end. Here's a picture of Bowling Green today. Uh, the university's off to the lower right. This is downtown here in the, the square. The uh, railroad track is up here and about a mile down that way is the public landing. Here is the public landing. Uh, steamboats operated into Bowling Green all the way up through the 1930s running out of Evansville up the Green River and then up the Barron River, stopping at Mammoth Cave Park. Uh, they're just now taking out some of the old lock and dams on the Barron and Green River that haven't been used. The last commercial traffic on the Green ended last year when I think the last coal loadout finished on the Green. So I don't know what's gonna happen. And I wanted to point out this packet boat got knees on the front of it. So it's pushing a barge, most probably an entertainment barge. There is their uh, first street car, I should say horse car. Downtown uh, Bowling Green, a pause. There is no colored photography in this day. All this was taken in black and white shipped over to Germany where an artist would hand color it and they were not besides photoshopping a car into the picture. Ooh, not even an American car, a European car. This is the entire Bowling Green streetcar system, three cars. Out at the uh, local distillery, uh, must be Time to go to work. The guys are jumping off the cars. And this was really common, was to put out uh, cards like this. You, a maybe at the depot to make a little extra money, the uh, station master, or you owned a, a uh, drugstore with a, uh, a, a counter where you serve drinks, or you were just the local Woolworths that. You would buy a generic card like this and then print the name of your city on here. So if you look around on the internet, you can find this card with other communities listed on this outside of Kentucky. Frankfurt, where I now live, moved here in 1965. Located here, the capital city, in case you didn't know that. A view of Frankfurt with the state capital up there. Lumber yard here. The uh, railroad station is over to the back of this photographer. Well, so. For some reason, my clicker doesn't work and I'm gonna to have to board these through. So we were looking this way. This was the line out to the distillery and to the uh, 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 rope factory. This line went out to the, uh, the park, COVID Spring Park. This line went up to the cemetery, 
the feeble-minded institute. I'm sorry, that's what they called it. The normal school, which was the Coward School, now Kentucky State University. The, uh, the feeble-minded school was moved down to Bowling Green. And then the line went out here and ended at the cemetery out here, Green Hill Cemetery. And then you had the line that ran over here, which was a real estate development. If you've ever wondered why the Kentucky Capitol is up here and not down here where they're going to rebuild it at where the old Capitol was, because the real estate developers got in cahoots with the state government and said, hey, if you build it up here, we can sell all these lots here and make money. Well, that's what happened. Uh, this is an interesting car. The distillery, which we're going to go and see in a minute, OFC. OFC, what does that stand for? Oh, only for Catholics. That's the joke. Old Firestone Copper. But everybody in Frank will tell you it only stood for only for Catholics because all the good Irish people from Good Shepherds worked out there. This transported the uh, bourbon from some of the distilleries along the line, OFC and, Her and Hermitage, to the bottling plant in town. Uh, this is becomes George Stagg, ancient age, and is now Buffalo Trace Distillery today. By the way, if you want to do one of the bourbon tours, you got to buy tickets way ahead of time because they immediately sell out. And when I first came here to town, you just watered down here any time of the day, walked in, picked yourself up a bourbon, uh, can, uh, bourbon ball and got yourself some free sips. You didn't have to go on the tour. Now you can't get even near this place. I, I think they had like a million people go through it last year. I can't remember. It's unbelievable. The people that show up here to uh, drink bourbon. And this, by the way, is where Pappy is made. Old Rip Van Winkle comes out of here. So if you ever drunk some Pappy, it came out of here. And if you don't know what Pappy is, shame on you, shame on you. Look it up. You can find it on eBay about one, uh, $1,100 per bottle. And if you go to a local bar and they got Pappy, they'll shell, sell to you for $50 a shot. It is good stuff. Okay. Here we are in the distillery, OFC. You can see it on the, the barrel there, the streetcar coming in. A view of downtown Frankfurt. That building still stands. Uh, this is in Frankfurt. Three of the streetcars are a uh, free show. Uh, Buffalo Bill came to town. Uh, other shows came to town. Annie Oakley did a shoot in town. Uh, a couple of the other big shows, I can't remember. Downtown Frankfurt. This was the old Capitol Hotel. Major story about that. Masonic Temple. Talk about it someday. Okay, here's what's going on. This is 1920. The streetcar companies have to pay for all of this. Tear the street up, put the rails in, put it back in. This is all being done by the streetcar company. By the way, they did some work down there a few years ago, and they found out when they abandoned the line, the, the streetcar company pulled up the rail, some of the rail, not even all the rail, and left the ties in. And this is why we're getting a, a washboard effect going down here. The ties rotted. And of course, the, the, the blacktop sank. So you had sort of a washboard effect going down. This is an interesting picture. You notice the gentleman standing here. By the way, that's the old YMCA there. And I never understood what was going on until it was explained to me. There was a lawsuit. A guy was suing because he was injured riding on the car. He got hit by the bridge support. And this guy's demonstrating the only way you get hit by the bridge support is to lean way out and put yourself in harm's way. Uh, this is a modern Brill car. We'll talk a little bit about these later. You notice the other cars are wood. 1920s, they go to lightweight steel. Lightweight steel. Yeah, these cars actually weigh half of what the weight of the wooden cars weigh. This is a sort of a savior for the streetcar lines. Downtown Frankfurt, the depot. Notice our streetcar running through. 
Chesapeake and Ohio train there. Long story. Aha! Look, listen, and live when you cross the railroad tracks. Our uh, motorman did not do that. He was hit by the l and train, flipped on his side. Uh, he and his passenger were injured. And you can maybe notice there's a train chain here. They dragged it out of the way. Whole series. You good people up in Northern Kentucky may not know who Paul Sawyer is. Local artist is so renowned. Painting of a streetcar here in front of the uh, old Capitol Hotel. This was another thing the streetcars did. Excursions. We can talk about that up in Northern Kentucky. But you took the streetcar from Lexington to Frankfurt and got on the, the uh, boat here in Frankfurt. You could then go up to Shaker's Landing, <clears throat> walk up the steps, and take the Southern Railroad back into Lexington. Or you could come over here and ride the uh, dance boat here on the Kentucky River and have a good time, come back in and get on the uh, streetcar back to Lexington. This is what happened to many streetcars, even some up in Northern Kentucky. As you know, the streetcar that they got in Cincinnati Union Terminal, uh, this, this, it was safe, was found out in Cynthia, I think it was, or Falmouth being used like this. Another one of those streetcars, uh, postcards, Frankfurt stuck in. Georgetown, Kentucky. Here's our streetcar line. She told me she was going to shoot me if I didn't get done. The courthouse in downtown. And once again, here we got two depots in uh, Georgetown. The Frankfurt in Cincinnati and the Cincinnati, New Orleans and Texas Pacific which for some reason the city of Cincinnati wants to sell. At that time, the uh, Frankfurt and Cincinnati was the Kentucky Midland. By the way, the Frankfurt and Cincinnati never got to Cincinnati. It got from Frankfurt to Paris and then stalled. Uh, another picture of one of the uh, things, single truck car, as I said, it's be called a trolley. Downtown Georgetown, they did not pave the street. At this time, they were running in the dirt. The street does get paved. Another view of the of in the uh, dirt. Henderson, Kentucky, way down here across the river from Evansville. This is their line from the depot, which is on the way on the outskirt town, downtown, touching with the public landing. There's the public landing. There's the depot. There's there's a lot of travel by boat because the the trains are not on the river. So if you were living in a river community, you could come into Henderson, come on over and get on the train, go north on the IC or east-west on the l &N, a view of Henderson. There is downtown Henderson. And notice the stones in the street. So you ladies could walk across the street without walking in the mud. The horse manure and urine, which is all being deposited in the street. So this is the way to get across the street to the post office. A view of Henderson, four streetcars. Another view of Henderson. And another view of Henderson. And here's your water cars. I said, they have to wash the street. They got to wash it down. They put oil down to keep the dust down in the summertime. They put water down to wash the horse droppings off, the urine off, and keep the street clean. They had street sleepers they ran. There's their barn, their powerhouse. Lexington, in the heart of the bluegrass. We're looking out from the Henry Clay Monument over in the Lexington. Streetcar coming out the cemetery. There it is. It was laid out basically to get out to the fairgrounds of the university. And as they developed the lots over in this neck of the woods, there's their first car. There they are out the fairground, six horse cars. The first electric powered car in town. It's out going to Kentucky State, I mean, Kentucky, UK, University of Kentucky. 
their power plant on Loudoun, their streetcar barn. They're tipping the car over so they can work underneath it. This was called high tech and was written up in many of the magazines across the United States. A view of the uh, barn, the buses that come in, last day running. Downtown Lexington, I want you to notice this picture. Oops, I guess it's this picture, I'm sorry. They've just recolored it to be nighttime. Another view, street sweeping. They're removing the snow. And all you people with your horses and carriage and cars are going to just ride where the street sweeper went and complain that they didn't do the rest of the street. Uh, these are the Braille cars that come in, the safety cars, the steel cars, the depot. I don't have enough time to go into that big story. Uh, there's their safety things they put out, big on safety, buses replacing. Another one the Post Guards put out. Send this to your girl. Louisville, oops, I didn't mark that. Jefferson County, major streetcar system down there. There's a stock certificate. They advertise, Cincinnati could advertise this. You could have taken the... Uh, Green line from Newport over to uh, Dixie Terminal, got on the car, come back and do uh, Covington, hopped on the number 17 Crosstown and gone back over Newport. Why didn't they think of that? Uh, Louisville Views. Remember, these are all colorized. The artists who did this have no idea what this looks like. I tell this to rail fans all the time who got a colored postcard and they're trying to match it. They're painting their locomotive to that it doesn't look like what the real locomotive is some artists in germany painted this stuff out the depot in louisville their car barn maysville kentucky up here i know you told me to get done in by 20 after i'm trying to get there it connected the cemetery to the amusement park to the uh, cno depot hitting the l and m depot there a view of Maysville. The cemetery's up there. The CNO depot's there. There's the CNO depot, still stands. There's the cemetery. One of two Union monuments in Kentucky. There's I just want to say, car. Charles, you're you're okay. No rushing. You don't need to rush too much. You've got some time. Okay. And if anyone wants to leave any questions, they can leave them in the chat. We haven't gotten any questions or comments so far. So okay. take your time a little. There they are. Uh, replacing the the uh, the car and those the, the street cars west end to the cemetery and if you were on the other side of the car it said east end CNO depot. There's the first car in in Maysville which is going to do away with the street cars because everybody's going to ride their automobile. Another view of of downtown. Another view of a streetcar running through town. It's a little slow down. Uh, a view of the streetcar coming up from the riverbank. The public landing was down here, and the streetcar tied to the public landing came up and tied to the two depots. The L and N took you over to Paris, where you could then branch out. And of course, the CNO took you either up to Ashland and on over to DC or into Cincinnati, where you can catch your, your trains anywhere else in the world. This is a publicity pro photo. They've gotten a real car in, and they're showing how nice it is. Now, this system was owned by the Kentucky Utility Company, which was a subsidiary of Midwest Utility Company. Uh, and my mind just shut down on me which was the big conglomerate that owned the uh, streetcar systems in the Midwest. And when they went bankrupt, uh, this was one of the reactions when I showed you where the, uh, the Congress separated the, the streetcars from the utilities. Yeah, I never really made a lot of sense. But anyway, they were owned by Kentucky Utility, which also owned the Winchester, the Georgetown, the Lexington and the uh, Central Kentucky, the Kentucky Traction and Terminal Interurban, 
and they owned uh, streetcar interurban lines throughout Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, down to Middlesboro, Kentucky, down here in the corner of the state, Cumberland Gaps down there. Uh, here you have the L and N coming in, swinging out through the tunnel. Uh, it was laid out as a uh, garden city based upon the uh, ideas of an Englishman, since it was an English city laid out. Uh, go over here. It sets down in this bowl, which is actually a meteor crater. They came here and found extremely rich iron ore. Middlesboro, that's why they called it that. Uh, but what they did not realize was the iron ore they found here was surface ore resulting from the exploding of that meteor, I don't know, tens of thousands of years ago. And they quickly scoffed up all the uh, iron ore. And Middlesbrough was settled back. Actually, it's, it's a very declining city. Here is the streetcar line. It's battery powered, narrow gauge and battery powered. See, there's nothing new in the world. This was the hotel they built there because everybody was going to come to Middlesbrough. And this is the battery powered streetcar. Well, not everybody came to Middlesbrough. This lasted about a year and then had a mysterious, mysterious fire and burnt down. And Middlesbrough just never became anything. Uh, let me go back. You see, it's Middlesbrough, B O R O U G H. It's if you look on the map, its name is Middlesbrough, B R O O. And if you go down there and you go to the, the city hall, it's the city of Middlesbrough, B O R O U G H. And you look at their mailing address, it's Middlesbrough. The post office changed the town's name to B R O. The city didn't change its name. So you got this strange situation. Okay. More than you want to know. Newport Covington. And you guys all know where that is. Here's the maxim that the streetcar lines got to your way up there. I got a nice presentation on this if you guys ever want it. Dixie Terminal over here. Your park here and your park out there. You got a couple of names of the park. Camel County. The car barn still stands. It's now a distillery. This is one of the streetcars, double truck, notice. By the way, your streetcars never got mechanic brakes. They always had hand brakes. We're out at Fort Thomas. At the end of the line, there has to be something at Fort Thomas. It's Fort Thomas. This is the Midway. This is the big curve of Memorial Parkway. The Highland Theater, where I got my first kiss from a young lady with a number 11 Fort Thomas car rolling by. At 3rd in uh, Washington in Newport, this was my doctor's office and this was my dentist's office. More than you want to know. Uh, the 4th Street Bridge, which the number 17 line ran across into Kenton County down at the old courthouse. Another one of the old cars. Out at Madison, going underneath the L&N track. Hey, this is what it looked like before they widened it out there. So the next time you go out in Madison, you duck underneath the railroad tracks, you can say this is what it looked like when the streetcars built their hole underneath it. Downtown Covington. I think this is turning on to Pike. I won't swear to that. No, 20th and Madison. Read the caption, you know where you are. Aha. And so I said, you had to daily maintain the overhead wires. This is a line car that the uh, they had for the, for the Cincinnati, Newport and Covington Street Railway maintaining the overhead wires, a daily thing that had to be done. Ice storm came along and they came down. Owensboro, 
down here in far western Kentucky. There's the line. Once again, tying the public landing to the depot, a colorized post guard. And this is actually doesn't look like anywhere in Owensboro. They just took a generic post guard and said it was Owensboro. You'll see this quite often with post guards, evening pictures. You go, Newport, I don't know, where's that? Well, that's because it's a generic post guard. There's a picture of one of their early streetcars, wooden car, downtown with a streetcar turning, offloading a streetcar off a flat car that's been brought in. Notice you got a slight sl slope to roll it off next to the car barn. There's their powerhouse. Paducah, Stone and Webster property. Once again, tying the riverfront to the depot and to the IC uh, store down there. Ohio River here, Tennessee River coming in here, the island here public landing down here, the depot out here. This was the IC shops down there. This about has all been torn down. The roundhouse is gone. The only thing left is this, which is owned by Progress Rail now. And this is filled with all of used locomotives that's being rehabbed or being used for parts downtown. Paducah, three streetcars. Another view downtown, downtown, passing track. This was a neat picture. If you ever notice the, the railroads in Europe are small, that's because the train is hooked together. In the United States, the trains can be long because they're not connected. Well, they're connected together, but they're not hooked. And this was a big publicity picture. This streetcar had started up and pulled all these. Well, the streetcar moved. And there was enough slack that it then moved this one, and then it moved this one, then it moved this one, this one, this one, this one. So this was the deal in the United States. You can move long trains because you got slack between them. They're not tied together. This is their line car down there for keeping the overhead wires repaired. Another one of those generic postcards, the guys put Paducah, Kentucky in. Richmond, Kentucky, it connected the Riney B, the Richmond Nicholasville, and Irving Railroad with the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. There it was, a horse car, mule car, actually. There's the Riney B Depot. There's the LN Depot. And it connected the two via the county courthouse. It went out of business very early because it was built to four feet, eight and a half inches which is an exact gauge of any wagon. And the farmers were always dropping both wheels of their wagon into the, the crack. And then when they tried to get out, breaking their wagon wheels, get away with. Somerset, Kentucky, down here, Pulaski County. It tied the railroad station to Ferguson. Ferguson. Hey, the guy who came up with the Cincinnati Southern, long story, you all know the Cincinnati Southern. Cincinnati, New Orleans, and Texas Pacific. How the city of Cincinnati wound up owning it and is now trying to sell their gold mine. But anyway, Ferguson's the lawyer that put it together. There's the depot. It ran through town out to Ferguson, which was, a, it says Queen and Crescent. That was not the name. That was their market ploy. Queen, Cincinnati, Crescent, New Orleans. Uh, CNOTP, this is now all gone. But this is their major locomotive repair shop. Uh, streetcar. It ran between downtown and uh, Ferguson, moving employees back and forth. They all bought Model Ts and began to haul people, and the streetcar folded. They had two modern Brill cars. Downtown Somerset still looks the same. And we will close out with this picture of Look and listen when you hit the railroad crossing so you're not a fatality or an injury at the railroad crossing. And I thank you for joining me as I went through this in 55 minutes within the hour I was told. And if we have any questions, I'll be happy to talk about the streetcars in Kentucky. 
Notice I did not touch upon interurban lines, which is a whole separate story here in Kentucky. So you guys want to work your magic and <laughs> Yes, thank you, Charles, so much. Um, perfect on timing. We, we're at 7.23. Um, I actually haven't seen any questions or comments in the chats. Okay. Heather, do you have any? No. I do see, thanks for a great presentation. Hope you come back. And that's actually what I was thinking too. I think you did such a great job. I would love for you to come back. So I hope that we can make that happen. Okay, we'll come back. We'll either talk interurbans or we'll talk uh, Cincinnati, New Orleans. I mean, Cincinnati, Newport, and Covington. Since we have time and nobody asked this, we got okay. to do this. The story of this uh, the uh, railroad line from Cincinnati through Ludlow down to uh, Chattanooga, if you have not read about it, it's a fascinating story. Cincinnati's at war with Louisville to move goods. The rail line they build from Cincinnati to Louisville has to be built to four feet, nine inches. They cannot directly transfer to Louisville and Nashville, which is five foot gauge. They all switched to standard gauge later on. The Constitution of Ohio does not allow the, a city to sell bonds to build a, to finance a railroad through a private company. It says nothing about the city building its own railroad. Mr. Ferguson comes up with that. And he issues bonds through the Erlanger Corporation. Hmm. Ever wonder how Erlanger got its name? And they build a railroad from Cincinnati to Chattanooga with ties to another railroad. They name it the Cincinnati Southern. The Cincinnati Southern is leased to the Cincinnati, New Orleans, and Texas Pacific, which operates itself as the Queen and Crescent, and is then is subleased to the Southern Railroad, which then becomes part of the Norfolk Southern. And the Norfolk Southern runs over on a lease, which is up in 2026, I believe. And now Norfolk Southern is trying to buy the line because they don't want somebody else to get the lease. And the city of Cincinnati has to put it to the, a vote by its voters. And the politicians are promising that every money they get will go in a trust fund and they will never dip into the trust fund. Do you believe politicians? Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens out of that whole deal, whether the citizens of Cincinnati vote to sell that line or whether they hang on the gold mine that they hang. I just had to throw that in. Fascinating little story about the, the rail line that comes up through Ludlow, up through Erlanger, and then on south to Lexington. Okay, we did have a comment from Mark that uh, maybe another session would be interesting with more detail on Northern Kentucky. Oh yes, more than happy to do that. That would be a great presentation maybe for us to sit on. Um, Heather, do you want to go ahead and um, uh, remind everyone of the trivia question? And um, we did have a winner, correct? Yeah, uh, the trivia question was, what was the Campbell County Streetcar Park and what was the Kenton County Streetcar Park? And those were Tacoma Park in um, Dayton and Ludlow Lagoon in Ludlow. And we did have a winner, Joe Warkany. So we will email you to get you your prize. And I am going to step in and make a little comment again. We were talking about this earlier. I grew up in Newport. I was not allowed to go to Tacoma Park when I was a kid because I'm growing up the late 40s, early 50s. Polio was the great scourge of people. FDR had it. And where did you catch polio, according to my mom? In swimming pools, because that's where FDR had caught it, swimming so I was never allowed to go swimming, and I was never allowed to go to any of the parks in northern Kentucky that had swimming. And thus, when I joined the Navy, I had never been in a pool, and I had to learn swimming when I was in the Navy. Okay, more oh, than you wanted wow. to know. Wow, no, that's so interesting. Um, no, and I, I mean, I love hearing those kind of tidbits, and I love hearing about your first kiss. Yeah, okay. Right here in northern Kentucky. Yes. <laughs> um, I, the only question I kind of had is I know that you briefly, you brought up a slide that showed something about safety. And I was just wondering what kind of, um, what kind of things did you have to worry about? Were there accidents with the streetcars or were there things that, um, as far as safety that you said, I saw the one gentleman standing, leaning obviously way too far off of the car. Today in the United States, we average 
every week a streetcar car accident. And 99% of the streetcar car accidents are caused because the streetcar swerved. You hear that? The streetcar swerved and hit the car. Streetcars can only go where the tracks go. Uh, but there is a streetcar uh, car collision every week in the United States. I've been amazed that Cincinnati's has so few. Atlanta's had a bunch. San Francisco's constantly having them. And some of the other cities, Denver, and that. And when I say streetcars, I'm also including light rail in that statement. Uh, one of the major problems the streetcars had was if you didn't notice the step was so high off the ground and you women had your long skirts and they were constantly getting caught as they were stepping off the car. Uh, so that was a, yeah, you can see where the, the kid's sitting here. You got a step, a step, a step, and a step down. So you with your long dresses, they're dragging on the floor to the step where the guy's sitting, then the step here and on the ground. So that was a constant problem. And the women in their long dresses had to be very careful about uh, getting off the streetcar that their dress did not get caught and they be tripped and flipped. Our next Northern Kentucky History Hour is going to be on Wednesday, May 3rd with Gary Johnson's back. He is going to uh, do his presentation, the monitor class ironclads at the dawn of industrialized warfare. And then that's going to be followed by a presentation on the Boone County water rescue. And that's with Angie Mendel and Cindy Wilson. Uh, for more Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, of course, check our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And all of our past episodes can be found there. I know a lot of people have reached out asking if they can find see a recording. So that's where you'll be able to find all of those. Um, everything will be um, uploaded there, usually the next day after the presentation. Um, I do want to give one last shout out to someone. This is to Wilma and Herb. They were so kind as to send in a letter, a little note here that I've got here, and um, a donation to the museum saying we enjoy the Wednesday night Northern Kentucky History Hour programs and thank you for offering this program. And we were really touched by that. That was very nice and thoughtful of you. So thank you, Wilma and Herb. That's all we got time for this evening. So thanks to all our sponsors and supporters and especially uh, Charles for an excellent presentation and for Heather, thank you for your help. And I wanna tell everyone to take care and have a great night and we hope to see you in two weeks. Good night, everybody.